Japan's rainy season is wet indeed. It's the time of year when moss grows lush and green at the roadside. Mosses are some of the most primitive terrestrial plants. They have no roots, only leaves and stems. Moss is deeply embedded in the Japanese way of life. It's long been an essential element of bonsai and of Japanese-style landscape gardens. Some Japanese gardens are entirely carpeted in lush green moss. Moss is also the home of tiny forest creatures. Certain insects and spiders use moss as a place to hide and to live. It is fundamental to their existence. On this edition of Begin Japanology, we look at moss, its remarkable ecology, and some of the uniquely Japanese ways of enjoying it. Hello and welcome to Begin Japanology, I'm Peter Barakan. Japan has a rainy season that comes along just as spring is turning into summer. In Tokyo, it generally starts in the early part of June and goes on into the second half of July, about 40 days in all. And during that time, we'll get an average of 270 millimeters of rain. It's hot, humid, sticky, not very nice. I'll quite often take a summer holiday during that period. But of course, the moisture is good for plants. You can see the whole city turns a shade greener during the rainy season. Moss plays a big part in that because moss needs a lot of moisture to thrive. Since we're on the topic of moss today, I have a magnifying glass and we have some over here. I'm going to take a look. Now, what do we see here? Wow. It's like a bush that's been miniaturized, kind of. Quite fascinating, really. Today on the program, we're going to be exploring the world of moss. I'm going to start off with a look at its little known biology. There are more than 20,000 species of moss in the world. Aside from very arid environments such as deserts, mosses are found everywhere on Earth, even at the poles and in the Himalayas. Japan has around 1,700 species of moss. The country's moist island climate provides a good environment for its growth. Even Japan's national anthem mentions moss. Here is the translation of the anthem by British Japanologist Basil Hall Chamberlain. It was done at the turn of the 20th century. A thousand years of happy life be thine. Live on, my lord, till what are pebbles now? By age united to great rock shall grow whose venerable sides the moss doth line. These lyrics are based on a poem from a 10th century poetry anthology. For more than a thousand years in Japan, moss has been a cherished symbol of eternity. Let's see some well-known Japanese mosses. Juniper hair cap moss, which is often found in gardens, looks like a grove of tiny Japanese cedars. This burst of bright green stars is a species of Rachometrium. And this is a kind of Leucobrium moss. It's like a soft, plush carpet. Kosagoe is a part of Nikko, a city in Tochigi. This is a farm specializing in moss. And this is Naoto Tezuka. He's been farming moss for more than 30 years. He knows how strange and how fussy it can be as a crop. 
If you put moss in an environment it doesn't like, it won't grow. You just have to let moss have its own way, and it seems to know what to do. Tezuka says many people misunderstand how moss grows. For one thing, mosses actually like sunlight. Mosses like sunny places more than people think. Because they lack roots to absorb water or nutrients, mosses need moist air and sun. That's what allows them to photosynthesize. Moss plants have leaves and stalks, but no roots. Instead, they attach themselves to surfaces using rhizoids, primitive root-like hairs. But rhizoids cannot absorb nutrients. For those nutrients, mosses depend on the photosynthesis that happens in their leaves. This means they need plenty of sun. It's a popular misconception that mosses like wet, dark places. Another misconception is about how mosses take in water. When water is sprayed onto dry moss, the leaves open up and take in water. They seem to be drinking it up thirstily. But too much water has the opposite effect on moss. Its primitive biology means it lacks the ability to store water. Mosses only need water when they are growing. If they have water, then that's good. Mosses often grow in places that get evening or morning dew. Really wet places, where water is always present, aren't good for mosses. This is Bryum argentium. You often see it growing on concrete. Notice that it favors vertical surfaces. This is because in the morning, the temperature difference between the ground and the air causes condensation. But any excess moisture runs off. The moss can get the moisture it needs each morning and can also dry out and receive sufficient sunlight during the day. This wall is ideal for its growth. Mosses also need water in order to reproduce. They have male organs and female organs. Let's watch the reproduction of scented liverwort, which is in the same general family as moss. When rain falls, the male organs release a cloud of sperm. The sperm swim through water droplets to reach the eggs inside the female organs. The fertilized egg forms a spore capsule from which spores are released. It is these spores which propagate the liverwort. Mosses are part of life in Japan, a common sight. But how many people know about their fascinating life cycle? There's certainly more to moss than meets the eye. This path leads to a Buddhist temple called Yonji in the Yotsuya area of Tokyo. It has a nice leafy, shady feel about it, doesn't it? It has the feel of a natural landscape, but in fact, this moss down here was planted just a month ago. And this is the gentleman who planted it, Mr. Takeyoshi Hosomura. Hello. What kind of moss is this? It's called haigoke, and it's a crawling type of moss. Hmm, it crawls. Hmm. Don't know about the crawling feel, but it has a nice sort of... It's almost like a carpet. Very pleasant, cool. And what kind of an impression were you going for with this design here? Well, it's a temple, but I didn't want to give it a traditional Japanese feel. I designed it like this in order to make it kind of cozy and modern. You think of moss as being something you see in forests and places. Is it actually suited to growing in an urban setting? 
Well, it's not easy. So what you have to do is imagine the ideal condition for moss to grow and try to simulate that as much as possible. That's the most important thing. If there's too much sunlight, moss gets damaged, so you need to block sunlight. Wherever you grow it, on your veranda or in your garden, you have to create the condition that's best for it, the condition that's most natural for moss. That's what moss likes. For ages, Japanese people have been enjoying gardens featuring moss. Let's take a look now at the ways that moss is used in Japanese gardens. One temple on the outskirts of Kyoto really showcases the wonder of moss. It's called Saihoji, and it's nicknamed the Moss Temple. The temple's garden, centered around a pond, is blanketed throughout the year in about 120 species of moss including Luke O'Brien. The garden was made in the 14th century by the Zen Buddhist monk Muso Kokushi. In Muso's original design, the garden had a bed of beautiful white gravel. But war and natural disaster left the garden in ruins it was then neglected for centuries and became overgrown with moss. As the moss grew, the garden was transformed. It took on a new kind of beauty. The local environment was uniquely suited to producing such a moss garden. A river flows near the garden. and it sits in the shadow of mountains. These conditions mean the garden is moist all year round. This moss garden was a beautiful accident. It became its own tranquil world, far removed from the cares of everyday life. Dry gardens flourished in Japan beginning in the 14th century. Moss has a special significance in gardens designed in this style. Dry gardens, as the name implies, feature no water. The main elements of a Japanese dry garden are a bed of gravel and a clever arrangement of larger stones. In this arid environment, moss is used to add a touch of moisture. This is garden designer Chisao Shigemori. He thinks moss is essential to dry gardens. The presence of the moss accentuates the stones or the shrubs. Moss is really the unsung hero of this kind of garden. This garden called Dokuza Tei is in Zuihoing, a Kyoto temple. Shigemori's grandfather Mirei a renowned 20th century garden designer came up with the layout. A Japanese dry garden is an abstraction of a natural landscape. It invites you to imagine for yourself the sweeping vistas of the landscape it represents. This stone towering over the garden is meant to be Mount Horai. In ancient Chinese mythology, this mountain was the dwelling place of sages. The gravel represents the rippling ocean. And there is moss among the rock and gravel. Shigemori says it serves a vital function. It gives these rocks the appearance of mountains that are less forbidding that people could venture into. There are insects and other living things in the moss and it provides an important place for them to feed. People can project themselves into that landscape, feel a part of it because of the moss. Mirei Shigemori's signature work is a garden at Tōfukuji, another temple in Kyoto. This garden, named Hōjō Teiyang, brims with innovative designs. It's widely considered to be a masterpiece. In this area, the gravel is raked into geometric forms punctuated by mounds of green moss. 
The composition is similar to that of a very large abstract painting. Further into the temple grounds is an area with yet another highly unusual design. It's a checkerboard pattern of paving stones and moss. This motif was popularized by kabuki actors, who began to wear costumes featuring it in the 18th century. Mire employed it here using just moss and stone. Moss helped to give this renowned Japanese-style garden a playful and modern appeal. This is Hosomura-san's studio where he works with numerous different kinds of moss. Now moss can also be used for indoor decorations. You can see some of them here. And Hosomura-san is going to show us some of the things he does. Uh, moss serving as a sort of flower pot. It's called a moss ball. A moss ball? You don't just grow the plant, you grow the moss too. That's the fun of it. That's beautiful. Mm. Now this is a miniature moss landscape. It's small, but it depicts a scene from nature, like a valley and a forest and so on. Oh, that's fantastic. You have your studio here and you have customers come in to buy your creations. What kind of people do you find in, in general come in here? People in the city who are stressed out and want something that's nice and soothing to look at. And these days there are also people who want to grow moss and treat it almost like a pet. Okay, next let's take a look at how moss is used in the well-loved art of bonsai. Bonsai is a traditional Japanese gardening art. Plants are grown in small containers and their trunks and foliage are groomed in artistic ways. These days there are bonsai lovers all over the world. Pine and maple are two common bonsai stars. But moss is a key member of the supporting cast. Tatsuya Nakamura, a bonsai instructor from Shimotsuke in Tochigi, explains how moss contributes to the art of bonsai. The ground is the most fundamental feature of the little bonsai universe that grows in the pot. But if on that ground the only thing you can see is bare soil, the bonsai lacks character. With moss growing on it, it acquires a patina of age, elegance and a touch of the divine. To see how moss works in bonsai, let's look at a 120-year-old Japanese red pine bonsai. Various mosses grow around its roots, emphasizing the dignity of its long life. It's not enough just to have some moss on it. It has to represent the natural world. The moss must be appropriate to a pine tree in nature. For example, this is higoke. This is a moss that grows well in dry, sunny conditions. By mixing in moss of this type, you make the bonsai look more appealing. Higoke is often seen on old pine trees out in nature. Its presence here gives the bonsai pine an ancient aura. This is a 300-year-old Japanese white pine. Its trunk is split, but the tree remains alive. It's a real bonsai masterpiece. The interior of the trunk is white with dead wood, but has green moss growing on it. The moss serves as a symbol of life and strengthens the visual impact. This bonsai is even more precious, a 500-year-old white pine. The tree's bark and roots and the moss and the soil have completely fused. Although it stands just 80 centimeters tall, it seems as imposing as a mighty full-grown tree. 
Moss has helped these magnificent bonsai trees to stand for centuries. Okay, dressed up like this, I feel like I'm a dental assistant or something, but it's do-it-yourself time. What are we going to do, Hosomura-san? Let's make a moss ball. A moss ball. Okay, that sounds like fun. All right. This is what you make a moss ball out of. It's a special kind of gardening soil. Now, essentially, this becomes a flower pot. Uh-huh. Okay. So you put it in the center, just like this. Then you adjust it, thinking about the flowers and the direction they're pointing in. And then you put more soil onto it, a bit by a little bit. The roots and the soil must become one. Add more soil, make it all nice and smooth. Okay, now it's time to put the moss on it. It's not easy to do it all at once, so start from the back. It's kind of like putting a kimono on it. Gently, very gently, make it stick. Gently push it in. You want to make it spherical. Now, wrap a piece of string around it. <laughs> I'm taking a total balls up of this. It's almost done. You've got to loosen up. <laughs> it's very easy to say. It's fun, right? <laughs> he said. Oh, that was hard work. <laughs> it looks like a tree-covered mountain. It has a very natural feel. Well, Hosomura-san, you were a very good teacher. Thank you very much. In nature, everything has a symbiotic relationship with moss. Let's take a look at that now. Kyoto has mountains on three sides. At the foot of them are major temples and shrines. Their forests and gardens are considered sacred and are protected accordingly. This is Honeng In, a temple in the Higashiyama area. In its lovely gardens, you can see a rich tapestry of woodland life. Plants and insects. Birds. Even flying squirrels and other mammals. These forest dwellers live together, sometimes cooperating, sometimes competing. The garden of Horneng In is blessed with plenty of pure spring water and lush carpets of moss. This abundance of moss provides an ideal habitat for many creatures. When in direct sunlight, moss dries out. It becomes dormant, waiting for the next rain. One creature that likes to live among the moss is the water bear. These tiny arthropods, less than a millimeter in size, suck nutrients from the leaves and stems of moss. As the moss dries out, so does the water bear. Its body contracts and it enters a dormant state called cryptobiosis. Rain falls and the moss becomes moist. Its leaves unfurl and begin taking in water. The water bear also absorbs water and once again starts to move. A type of sheet weaver spider spins webs in moss to trap its prey. 
Its web is typically just two millimeters across. For a creature so small, the moss is like a dense forest. Moss harbors tiny life forms. Let's look at another fascinating spider that lives in mossy gardens. Pops out of a hole in the ground and seizes insects. This is a type of trapdoor spider. It burrows in the soil and catches its prey not by spinning a web, but by grabbing creatures that come close to its burrow. Camouflage in the entrance to the burrow is the key. The spider mixes moss into the soil to reinforce this trapdoor. The completed trapdoor is indistinguishable from its surroundings, and it's all thanks to the moss. Moss holds many threads in the web of life. The mossy gardens in Japan's ancient capital of Kyoto are a precious refuge for many creatures. Moss really is the sort of stuff that I never gave a second thought to. But after today I'm finding myself getting you almost attached to it, I think. Especially now that Hosomura-san has given me this souvenir to take home, I'm going to do my best to grow it. He did give me some good advice though, which is that moss doesn't like air conditioning. So if you ever think of growing any moss at home, do switch off the air conditioning. Just think, if it's not good for plants, it's probably not good for you either. We also need to conserve energy. See you next time.